All right, we find ourselves tonight in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Powerful, powerful verse to me, anyway. Um, It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So as you look at that, the scripture is saying not only don't let rotten things come out of your mouth, but very diligently make sure that you are encouraging each other and that it isn't that you're silent, it's that you're looking for ways to build each other up and encourage each other and show grace to each other. Um, When you look at the words in the Greek, that word for unwholesome is worthless, rotten, bad, corrupt, putrid. It's, uh, and he's talking to believers here. Remember that. So um, it isn't that just because we know Jesus that we're above what he's saying here. And then um, the word there for helpful is actually beneficial. In the uh, English translation here, you see the word benefit at the end, but that word for benefit is actually grace. And the word for uh, helpful is actually beneficial. Anyway, so all the things are in there. And then according to their needs, what would be useful, what would be helpful to somebody. So it's not always like complimenting somebody. Sometimes we need more than compliments. Sometimes we need somebody to admonish us in grace and in love. But we are, part of our responsibility is not only not to do unwholesome talk, but we're going to look into, but that we would very deliberately find ways to be helpful to somebody else by what we say. I mean, I can think back in my life of words that were spoken to me that impacted me greatly. We're going to talk about some of those things later. And, and sometimes it was from somebody who had no idea what I was going through, Right? So then you know this is a gift from God. He's using somebody. They're oblivious to what the need is, but because they're being obedient to the Lord, the Lord's using them to bless. In the Greek, that word, the Greek people use that word to talk about rotten fruit and putrid fish, stinking things. Now, if you know me at all, you might know I don't like fish, period, even when, <laughs> even when it supposedly smells good. Uh, but this word is word that they would use when the fish was rotten. So to me, that, that really spoke to me because, yeah, that smell is not a good smell to me, even when the fish is good. So many words would fit into that category, cursing, vulgar phrases, crude jokes, And as I look at you ladies and the ladies that I spoke with this afternoon, I mean, unless you're faking me out, I don't see cursing and vulgar phrases and crude jokes coming out of you. But look what else it says. Sarcasm, unkind, or mean-spirited remarks. And if we think of ourselves, sometimes we know we may be guilty of a mean remark or a sarcastic remark or something that's mean-spirited. The unwholesome talk is forbidden in God's word for basically three reasons. Number one, it defiles the speaker's own soul. It hurts the person saying it. And we're going to look at some verses that say exactly that. Not only that, it's an offense to God, right? Because we're supposed to be walking worthy. But then specifically in this verse, because it's a sin against others, tearing them down instead of building them up. Unwholesome talk proceeds from the corruption in the speaker. And we're going to look at some verses that talk about that. When ugly comes out, it's because it's there's ugly in here. It doesn't just happen without cause. Paul contrasts the unwholesome speech with words that are edifying and appropriate to the situation. I found that really um, interesting in the verse as you look at according to their needs like what does the person need and to pray about that and say how can I encourage somebody 
and and uh, you know sometimes a smile or a word just hello is nice and it's encouraging but it looks deeper here like what can I do that would really be helpful to this person that using them and then the word here for building up is edification. I won't try to pronounce it, but O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E. We found it a lot in our study when we were studying Thessalonians and now that we're studying Ephesians. And it means to build up, to encourage someone. First Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Romans 14, 19, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. You know, that's what I pointed out the, in, in 429, our verse for tonight, it says, don't let any unwholesome talk. And down here in Romans 14, 19, it says, make every effort. It's, it's, it's like, not like, oh, well, if it comes up, but to deliberately plan how can I encourage you? How can you encourage me? It's that uh, one another life that we've talked about before, what mutual edification should be. Hebrews 3, 13, encourage one another once in a while, daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It's, it, that verse is interesting to me because it's talking about Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. So it isn't just me guarding my mouth and what I should say, but I should be so in tune with the Lord that I'm able to encourage you with what I say. Because look what it says, that so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sometimes we don't know what a person's going through, but just a challenge that we might give them from God's word. Maybe it's like, man, I was reading the word today and I came across this verse and it just really spoke to me and I thought I'd share it with you and it may be just what that person needs to hear. And the scripture's really plain about that, how you and I encourage each other. It's very plain in the next verse, Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Of course, the day meaning the return of the Lord. But the word spur, you know me, if, I, if I'm looking at a verse, I'm like, okay, spur, I think I know what it means to spur on. So I look up that word in the Greek and it means to spur means to stir up, to stimulate. And so what this verse is saying, that I should live such a life and the words that come out of my mouth should be of such a fashion that people around me are like, man, I need to, I need to step it up. I need, to, I need to share my faith more. I need to be in the word more. I need that you and I, as we live our life, should be encouragement to other people that, that stimulating them to live more godly. Not that we walk around like, woohoo, look at me. But it's just, it's so much a part of us that his word oozes out of us and the way that we act encourages somebody else who may not be living as much for the Lord as they should, saying, whoa, look at, look at Amy, look at Joyce. Look what, I, I need to be more like that. I mean, that's, that's that one another love that we're, that we're talking about. And there's so many verses that talk about that. And so to me, as I look at uh, Ephesians 4.29, it says, don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But the second half of that verse really speaks to me. It, what should I be doing? Should I be just quiet and not say it naughty words? No, I should be busy sharing and caring and encouraging and building up. I told you the word benefit there is from the Greek word uh, charis, which means grace. Our words are to be gracious and kind. The scripture is clear that it's important not only to avoid unwholesome words, but we're to deliberately speak forth words that build others up 
in grace. Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. We know that salt is a preservative against corruption. We know before they had refrigerators, they'd use salt to keep meat from going bad. And I couldn't help but think when you look at the word of unwholesome witness, which is that putrid, rotten food, rotten fish smell, um, the salt would be the opposite of that, right? It is to keep that from happening. Um, And of course, salt also enhances taste, indicating that Our words should be full of grace and not bitterness. Matthew Henry says, Grace is the salt that seasons our discourse. Gracious. Proverbs 16, 24. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Think about it. You may know someone who by your encouragement of words, often sharing scripture or uh, just love with somebody else can be healing to them. <clears throat> I mean, isn't that cool? I mean, isn't that a cool opportunity that we have? I think I brought. I think I've brought it in before. If I haven't, I have this treasure chest. I found at Hobby Lobby, <laughs> and it is stacked full of words that meant a lot to me. There's letters from students, there's letters from my kids, there's notes from parents, that when I got them, they, they were healing to me. And so I'm a, I'm a word collector. <laughs> and I have this treasure chest, and I love to go back, and I love to look at it and read it and remember. And the person that wrote the note or wrote the card <laughs> may not even remember having done it, but it was healing to me. And that's the part we can play in each other's lives. Um, Even when you don't know if someone's in pain. You know, we know a lot about each other, but there's a whole lot we don't know, right? There are things that we keep pretty to ourselves. And, um, but the Lord knows. So when he puts it on your heart, To encourage somebody, you better do it. (laughs) Because he knows that person needs encouragement. You may not even know why that person needs encouragement. But my, my rule is if the Lord brings somebody to mind, I better at least shoot a text, maybe make a phone call, maybe send a letter. I don't know why, but I'll do it. And I know that it's come back to me that way. I've been thinking about you. You know, you get that note from somebody you haven't heard from, from whenever. And they say, you know, I've been thinking about you. And you think, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Because that's a love note from him through that person who may not even know what the need is. Proverbs 16, 24. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And then the scripture says, according to their need. In other words, the words are useful. So as I look at that and these words being useful, it isn't always a compliment word. It isn't always an I love you word. Sometimes in the body, there have to be admonishing words, right? According to the need, according to what's useful. I think of 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. So there's all kind of different ways that God can use us and our words in someone's life. Proverbs 25, 11 and 12 says, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a ruling rightly given. Like earrings of gold or an ornament of fine gold is the rebuke of a wise judge to a listening ear. In other words, sometimes the love note is rebuke (laughs) if we need it. And to love someone enough. I think of that in relationship when you were 
parenting or you have someone you really love and you see them going in the opposite direction, as a parent, would I love my kids if I didn't correct, if I didn't admonish, if I didn't say words that they needed to hear? Here's a good one. Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. You see the contrast there of weighing what you're going to say, taking the time to think about what you're going to say, making sure you're, that, that the Lord's leading you to say what you're going to say, as opposed to first thing out, it comes to your mind, comes out of your mouth. Um, weighing or gushing. I don't know. I love scripture. <laughs> it's so cool. Uh, Proverbs 12, 18 the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And again, that healing could be in the form of admonishing even, but it brings healing rather than stabbing at like a wound. We've probably all experienced that sometime in our lives when someone has said something that hurt us deeply. It goes like, instead of the healing, it, it's the wounding. Proverbs 15, 4. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Wow. I Teaching in classrooms, I've um, been a mentor teacher where I'll be sitting in the back of a classroom and I'll watch as a teacher says something to a student and you just see them melts in the worst possible way like really crushing their spirit and then you see other times when words are said that just that the student could just like fly out of the classroom um there's so much power in our tongues james says watch out and james 3 6 the tongue also is a fire a world of evil among the parts of the body it corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And it itself is set on fire by hell. James is talking to believers. He says, who's controlling this? Are you letting the Lord control this? Or are you letting Satan control this? And how one word can cause so much grief in a family you probably all know of families, people that don't speak to each other, that may, may not even remember what was said. They just know something was said that offended them. James 3, 9 and 10. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. I don't know about you, but when I read that verse, I get I get, get this picture in my mind of going to church, singing all the hallelujah, praise the Lord songs, and then getting in the car and <laughs> complaining about this person or complaining about that person or cutting down somebody. Wow. I know... Uh, One of the things that my husband and I really worked at, and I've probably mentioned it before, but we tried really hard never to criticize anybody in the church in front of our kids. That doesn't mean that he and I didn't have some interesting conversations between the two of us, but we wanted our kids to love the people, to love the ministry, to love being part of it. We didn't want anything negative uh, to come out of our mouths concerning the people in the church that we loved. Because guess what? They're, they're, they're imperfect people. And guess what? We were imperfect people, right? So you're, anytime you're in ministry, you're dealing with imperfect people. And the Lord says, don't, don't go to church and say, hallelujah, praise God, and then spend your time criticizing and tearing down his children. Don't do it. The tongue speaks what the heart tells it to say. 
A foul mouth comes from a corrupt heart. And the question is, what spills out when you're bumped? There's that illustration of when ladies used to carry water jugs on their heads, and if somebody bumped into them, water would spill out. And, and the correlation is, what happens to me when I'm bumped? When something happens that I wasn't planning on or that I didn't like or someone says something to me, what spills out? Well, the scripture says what spills out is what's inside. I don't know about you, but um, I've said to myself before, where did that come from? Like you say something and then you think, well, well this is where it came from. <laughs> it came from the heart. That's what the scripture says. Matthew twelve thirty four. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in them, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. And the little note that I made there is when we regret something we've said, we need to check the condition of our heart. Because what comes out of our mouth comes from what's in our heart. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do, Sharon put her own little say in there, uh, because it agrees with Matthew 12, 34. But guard your heart because everything you do and everything you say comes from your heart. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or anything is praiseworthy, spend your time thinking about those things. Don't spend your time thinking about how bitter you are about something or how mean somebody was to you or something that someone else did. That happens in life, of course it does. But he says, don't spend all your time consumed with that negative. Consume yourself with the positive things of the Lord. Words can do so much good and so much harm. Probably nothing else can cause so much hurt or so much healing. Psalm 141.3 says, Lord, set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I don't want to be guilty of saying what I shouldn't say. That includes gossip, right? <laughs> Sometimes in the form of prayer requests. <laughs> you know what I mean. 1 Peter 3.10, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Proverbs 18, 21 says the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. I'm like, what? So I studied on that verse a little bit and basically the meaning of the verse is this, that from the tongue comes the greatest good or the greatest evil and you and I will eat the fruit of what comes out of it. In other words, God's going to reward us if what comes out of it is blessing. And if what comes out of my mouth is unwholesome, then eventually I'll pay for that. It'll come back on me. We are to embed wise words in others to provoke godliness. We're going to look at that. Um, I wish I'd have put the notes here in different order, so I'm going to talk about them in a different order. But Stephen Covey says, if we do not teach our children, society will. And Deuteronomy, I'm skipping down to the bottom there, Deuteronomy 6, 7, says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. 
The word impress there means to teach diligently, to pierce, to sharpen, to prick the heart. We are in a position to do this with nieces, nephews, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And, and the, the challenge here for me is, like I have a little Titus, eight-year-old Titus, have him every Wednesday afternoon from the time I pick him up from school. Well, last night he spent the night, but for many hours. So what am, what, are we just having fun? Are we just baking Christmas cookies? What are we doing? How am I sharing God's word with him? The scripture says, impress it on your children, even your adult children. Talk about it when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. It should be a natural thing. My kids used to give my husband a hard time because every night at dinner, there was never a dinner without a sermon that attached to it. I don't mean a real sermon, but trust me, there was always talking about how to live, what God's word says. And as I see this verse, I, for me, uh, it was bedtime. I mean, so many spiritual conversations that I had with my kids and now with my grandkids about the Lord, about his word, about the importance of his word. And I think of what Stephen Covey says, if we don't teach our children, society will. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? My son still gives me a hard time because because I would give him multiple choice questions all the time when he was in high school. Because he was the type, my son was the type where I would say, hey, Scott, what do you think about this? And he'd go, I don't know. And I'd have to go, well, A, B, C. And then he would give me, he would pick one. <laughs> um, and it wasn't that he was being stubborn, but he really had a hard time articulating what he was thinking. But I wanted to know what was going on in his head. It wasn't like, well, I don't know, okay. No, I want to know. <laughs> and sometimes it was as easy as, if you could take one of these girls, which one? I don't know. Would it be this one or this one or this one? This one. Why? I want to know. I wanted to know what's going on in his head about so, so many things. I came across in our study this verse in Ecclesiastes, and it really, really spoke to me. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 10 and 11. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and he wrote what was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Do you understand what that verse is saying? First of all, it's saying, listen, when it says the teacher, that's the grandma, the parent, the, the, the school teacher, the, any teacher, right? We're all teachers. And it says the teacher searched to find just the right words, and then he found them, and they were upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails. So I'm like reading that verse and I'm like, goads, what goads? <laughs> and the word there is a, to goad something on is to cause, to make someone do something. So my words should encourage someone to positive action. Whether I'm talking about a friend or a grandkid or whoever I'm talking about, I should first make sure that the, what, the advice that I'm giving, the words that I'm saying are upright and true. That means they come from God's word. The principles come from God's word. And that these words should goad others on to positive actions. And then look what it says. They're like firmly embedded nails in my head. Firmly embedded in my head. You know, because of the internet and Facebook and all that, I mean, I hear from students that I taught 40 years ago. And sometimes they'll say, 
Miss Feather, remember when you said this? Or you said this? And I'm like, I really don't remember. <laughs> but those words that I said were embedded in their brain so that 40 years later, they're rehearsing them to me. And luckily, they like to compliment me. <laughs> but I can't help, but I'm not naive enough to think that there weren't words that came out of my mouth that had the exact opposite embedded in somebody's head. Words that were said that you can't forget. I'm like, what? So my responsibility is to consider what I say, make sure what I say is upright and true, is consistent with God's word. It should goad, it should encourage positive action in whoever I'm talking to, and then to realize that those things can be embedded in somebody's head. So I did a little project that I'm going to share with you. And uh, you'll know that these words are embedded in my head because most of them you've heard out of my mouth before. But I thought, okay, Sharon, think of people who spoke truth to you 50 years ago, 60 years ago, how many years ago? And the, they still are brought to my mind, embedded in my brain. Here's some of them. My mom, every day of my life growing up, when she got me up, it was never, come on, get up, it's time to go to school, get, get going. It was always the same. Sharon, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it every day. I still think of that when I get up in the morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And then another one of her, it's interesting because I talked to my sister this afternoon and I told her that I was sharing some of mom's quotes and, and she came up with some of the same ones that I'm sharing with you. So they were embedded in her head as well. But when things would go wrong, like you got a flat tire, like a, something was canceled that we planned on doing or seemed, things just seemed to go wrong, my mom would always say this, kids, we're making a memory. We're making a memory. And it was so true because when we looked back on it, I remember one day particularly when we had a flat tire and we didn't get to go where we were planning to go, but we had so much fun at this gas station and we made new friends. And uh, it just reminds me of Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. And that good might not be going to the party you plan to go to. It might be a flat tire that good might be but you're making a memory. And then I know I've told you this before, but it's come back to me so often. When something would happen and somebody would hurt my feelings, somebody would say something to me that was hurtful, and I might come home from school in tears and talking to my mom, and she was always kind and sympathetic. But then this would come out of her mouth every time. Sharon, remember how that made you feel? You don't ever want to make somebody else feel that way. In other words, yes, this was hard. Learn from it. Learn from that. It wasn't that she wasn't sympathetic, but she was so wise not to just say, oh, you poor baby. <laughs> but she would always use that experience to say, okay, you learn from this. You don't ever want to think how bad you feel. You don't ever want to make someone else feel that way. And then I thought the best advice my husband gave me, and I, I even hesitated to write some of these down because I know I've shared them with you before, but I thought, well, that, that means they're embedded. <laughs> they're embedded up here. But, the, you know, when you're in a position of, we're, we're all open to criticism, but when you're in a position of leadership, everything you do, somebody usually finds fault with. And he was a master of this. He said, Sharon, all criticism that comes your way has at least an element of truth. Even if it's only that you've given someone the wrong impression about something that led them to misjudge you. Do you understand what he's saying? You might have been right in what you did, but somehow they got the wrong impression 
of what you were thinking, of what you were doing. Make the changes that need to be made and then throw the rest away. In other words, learn from criticism. Don't hate it. Learn from it. And then I gave you scriptures that would back that up. Why A wise person in Proverbs says that they learn from correction, that they gain understanding from correction, that it builds their patience and understanding. And then I thought of my college years, and I wrote down a couple professors that I had who would say these things over and over to me. And they weren't, probably were not original with these men. I'm not saying that this person created this quotation. I'm just saying that as a student of theirs, I heard it out of their mouths over and over again. And I was 18 to 21 when I was in college. And I'll tell you, these words are embedded in my head and I hear them all the time. President George Miles, keep short accounts with sin. <coughs> hey kids, keep short accounts with sin. First John 1, 9. As soon as you realize you failed the Lord, take care of it. If you study First John, that's what the whole book of First John is about, what sin costs the believer. And he'd say, you don't, want, you don't want to lose boldness in prayer. You don't want to lose fellowship with the Lord. Keep short accounts with sin. Then he'd say, the Bible, he'd point to the Bible and he'd say, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book, which we've all heard, right? Psalm 119.11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Dean Johnson, good things are the enemy of the best. I can see him, I can visualize him, I can hear him say it. And it makes me think of Hebrews chapter 12 where it says, um, talks about sin, but then it also says, throw off everything that hinders. Things that hinder your spiritual life might not be sin. They just might be good things that you do instead of the best things that you do. That your priorities are not where they should be. That you spend too much time in good things, but not the best things. And then Dr. Woodburn, all truth is God's truth. All truth in as much as it is truth is God's truth. Boy, going to secular universities, did that verse come to my mind a million times? Like, okay, I'm listening to this professor. What he's saying, even though he's not a believer, does it contradict scripture? Throw it out. Does it go along with scripture? Embrace it, right? All truth in as much as it is truly truth is God's truth. And then, of course, for me, the biggest source of words that are embedded in my brain are scripture. Sharon, love being merciful. Sharon, don't be ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of me. Sharon, stay fresh and green in your old age. Sharon, don't act like a mere human. Sharon, walk worthy. Sharon, run errands for me today. Sharon, have a thankful heart. Wow, that one. It's hard to read New Testament books without seeing the admonition to have a thankful heart. And the more you understand that, the more you realize that I can't be thankful and greedy at the same time. I can't be thankful and selfish at the same time. I can't be thankful and bitter at the same time. I can't be thankful. It guards your heart. Sharon, I can do much more than you can imagine. Trust me. Sharon, you show love for me by helping others. And just as I was typing those up and thinking of You know, I didn't like sit down and go through anything. I'm like, okay, these are the verses that are embedded in my brain. These are the verses that I think of constantly. Warning. Unwholesome words can also be embedded with destructive results. You know, I grew up in a home where I shared some of the things that my mom shared with me. I also grew up in a home with an unsaved dad. And 
Many of those words were not positive words that were embedded in my head. But I've chosen, forget them. I've chosen to keep those that goaded me as Ecclesiastes. You gotta look at that Ecclesiastes verse, it's so good. You were out there when we were talking about it. But it, it's so good, those words that goad me on to positive action and those words that are embedded in my brain to help me and to think that we have the privilege to do the embedding to share over and over and over again. I wonder if our grandkids or if our kids were here with us right now, what would they say? Well, this is what my grandma always said, or this is, right? What would that be? What, what an opportunity we have to share words of truth with people. So, I don't know about you, but when I looked, at Ephesians 4.29, I'm like, yes, I don't want unwholesome talk coming out of my mouth. I don't want to have mean-spirited, sarcastic words coming out of my mouth. But the second half of that verse is what really got to me, that I would spend my time deliberately encouraging, building up, sharing truth. And then when you look at that verse in Ecclesiastes, that you have the privilege of and remember, the first part of the verse talked about, yes, what the wise person says is upright and true. This is truth from God's word that I can goad, encourage others to do positive things, and then that I would embed, like nails, like a hammer nailing in a head, words that will never be forgotten, and words that will constantly encourage us, especially the bottom half of that page, especially the words of God that speak to us continually. Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for your word, for this beautiful, convicting verse in your word, for the verse here in Ephesians, and for me especially, this verse in Ecclesiastes, that we have the privilege, Lord, of weighing our words, of finding truth, of sharing the truth of your word any way we can, and to realize, Lord, whether our intention is or not, that we're embedding these truths and these statements in the minds of those we come in contact and those we love. Lord, we love you. We want to love your word. We want to take very seriously the opportunity of sharing the truth of your word with people we come in contact with, with other believers, with our kids, with our grandkids, with our great-grandkids. What a privilege. Lord, we love you. In Christ's name, amen.